What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Before I dive in, I need to say a huge thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. If you're not aware of what Magellan TV is, it is a membership streaming service founded by filmmakers, producers, curators to bring you a unique and ever-changing selection of documentary movies, series, and exclusives. If you are documentary obsessed like I am, I've always had a thing about documentaries, but you have a hard time finding new content, this this is basically tailored straight to you. They have all kinds of genres from space to nature to history, biographies, and then of course my absolute favorite and probably yours too, true crime. New programs are added weekly to satisfy your need for new documentaries and you can watch this content anytime, anywhere. It's compatible with things like Roku, Amazon Fire, Google Play, Apple TV, and even some of their content is streamed at 4K at absolutely no additional cost. Plus the documentary stream with no interruptions, which was probably one of my personal biggest selling points. Because today I'm going to be speaking about a uh case that some believe was a wrongful conviction, I decided to go ahead and watch a documentary on Magellan TV called A Question of Innocence, which is about a man on death row. His name is Tommy Ziegler, and he has been on death row now for four decades, a very, very long time for a crime that he swears he did not commit, the murder of his wife, his wife's two parents, and um, a bystander. And it's absolutely insane, and it goes a lot into the process of appealing and working with a broken system and kind of things that he saw from his perspective. And then something that I found very interesting was that it also kind of went into the death penalty and if it's an acceptable thing within the justice system since the justice system has so many flaws. So there's always something for everyone on Magellan TV, so I highly suggest that you guys go ahead and give it a try. You can go to try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle and you will get a month free membership trial. All that information I will have down below. It's something that I've personally really enjoyed. There's a lot of great content on there. So maybe once you go ahead and get your free trial, you can drop some of your favorites that you've watched down below so we can all watch these different documentaries together. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. And now let's jump right in. You guys, this case, I don't think I've ever sat down to film a video and still felt so unsure. It's one of those times where I've looked into all the information that I possibly could before I had to go ahead and make this video. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pages of trial transcripts and different documents and all sorts of information. And it was so difficult to, to put everything together into any sort of cohesive video that probably made the best sense possible, but I'm here to absolutely try. Um, we're going to be speaking today about the murders of Devin and Damon Routier, and then the controversy over the innocence or guilt of their mother, Darlie Routier. This case is insane, and that does not even scratch the surface at all. There's a very serious, clear divide between those that believe she is guilty without a doubt, and then those that believe that this innocent woman is sitting on death row. And at this this point in time, I honestly cannot even be, I can't choose a side. And I feel like I'm flustered even coming into this because there's so much contradicting information from almost every individual involved in this case um, that I feel like it's almost impossible to understand what happened. It's almost impossible to understand all of the different stories that were told. I wasn't able to make a final judgment. Plus a lot of the different records have not been released. So I feel like without those two, it's really difficult to kind of decide how I feel about this. Everything from statements to those involved to nurses, prosecutors, investigators, they've all changed. Her supporters and those against her even seem to have two entirely different stories stories and perspectives, um, you know, extremes, I guess you could say. There have been people that have written books fully on either her innocence or her guilt that have even then, after writing books and dedicated years to looking into this, that have changed their mind. There's even a juror that's come forward that changed his mind. Um, there's documentaries on this, tons and tons of them, and I watched every single one, and even they seem to have different information or leave things out or, you know, completely different standpoints. And I'm just saying I wish you all luck before we get into this. This is definitely one of those where 
this is not where it ends once you've watched this video. You've got to go and look at all of this information for yourself. I have multiple different websites listed down below. Some are websites of supporters of Darlie Routier. Some are, you know, websites that show her guilt, her new prosecutors her um, that are dealing with her appeal right now. They have an entire website with photos and documents and transcripts and all sorts of things. So definitely do not stop after you've watched this and... Buckle in. Um, I do want to also let you guys know that this is a very upsetting case, um, very, very upsetting, involving young children. There are going to be pictures in this video of blood. I will not show any bodies. That's entirely disrespectful, but I am going to show as much evidence that has been released to the public as possible when it comes to, like, again, pictures of the crime scene, no bodies, and wounds on Darlie herself. And it's just, it's gonna be a lot. So, viewer discretion is seriously advised in this video. Darlie was married to a man named Darren Routier and they seem to have what appeared to everyone on the outside, a great marriage and a great life that a lot of people would have really wanted to have. Darlie was 26 years old at the time. I'm not exactly sure how old Darren was, uh, but they were very, very successful for their age. Darren had started an electronics company after they got married. They got married pretty young, immediately went on to have children, and you know, he decided to start this business. And it was an electronic company, and it immediately was successful. In 1995, I believe his company made over $330,000, which for that year and just in general, that's a lot of money. So they were able to take a lot of vacations and they had a boat, they each had a car, they built a beautiful home from the ground up in Rowlett, Texas, where they lived, which that community in itself was kind of known for being very well off. A lot of people were retired to this community. There was a big lake nearby. Darlie was able to be a stay-at-home mom to their three children, and she was known to be a really great mom. Um, she had three boys, as I said, six-year-old Devin, five-year-old Damon, and eight-month-old Drake. Devin was apparently the wild card. He was the oldest, so that's, in my opinion, not very surprising. He could do anything and everything. He was really out there, really outgoing, really loud, really playful. Um, but Damon was kind of more of the calm child. He didn't want to do anything too crazy. He just kind of sat back and watched his brother do all the craziness. And he was just kind of more sweet and more cuddly and loving. But something happened on the night of June the 6th, 1996, that changed all of their lives forever and has created a massive, massive controversy. At 2.31 a.m., the early morning hours of June the 6th, an unexpected call came into 911 and it was Darlie Routier and she was screaming. Now, I am about to play a portion of this 911 phone call. It is, again, very upsetting. So I'm not going to play the entire thing, I don't think, um, but I will put a timestamp here to where you can fast forward to if this is not something that you want to hear. Yeah. 
lasted for a total of five minutes and 42 seconds and as you can hear from that 911 phone call Darlie was hysterical I think that's kind of the best way to describe it she told the dispatcher over and over again you know a man came in someone came in and stabbed me um, stabbed my children you can hear her screaming that you know her boys are dead or her boys are dying and that you know, someone needed to come quick, an ambulance needed to come and help her. And while she was still on the phone with 911, the very first officer arrived, Officer Waddell, at 2.34 in the morning. So it only took him three minutes to get there. He was apparently only about two turns away, a couple miles down the road. Um, and when he arrived on the scene, Darren was running out of the house in just jeans. He didn't have a shirt on, no shoes. Um, I believe he had blood on him and he was screaming. So he apparently was you know, telling the officer, my boys have been stabbed, you need to help us. He was trying to go and get a neighbor named Karen who was a nurse and he wanted someone to come and get their eight month old boy, Drake, who was upstairs and apparently completely fine. But it was very clear from the start that this was, this was a huge, huge issue. Something really bad had happened. Upon arrival, the officer heard what Darley was saying to the dispatcher. When he walked inside of the home, he immediately noticed blood was on the floor in the entryway. And um, when you walked into the home, kind of the stairs to go upstairs were on the right. You walked through like an entryway hallway. The living room was on the left and it was open into the kitchen, which was then on this side. I will have a picture up um, that has a layout of the area. And Darley was standing at the bar on the phone with 911. Um, Waddell noticed that she was standing there. She was covered in blood as well. She had the phone in one hand and then she had a towel in the other pressed to her neck, likely to stop the bleeding. Um, and according to this officer's statement, he was under the impression that an attacker was still in the home because Darley looked at him and was like, he's in there. He ran to the garage, he's in the garage. So the officer kind of positioned himself between Darley and Darren and the boys and the garage which was on the other side of the kitchen because again he thought there was still an attacker in the home and because he was there he asked Darley a handful of times I think he said three in particular um, three times in particular he told her to go and help one of the boys because as soon as Darren got back inside Darren was immediately with the oldest boy Devin um, Waddell said he was down there it appeared as if he was giving him CPR or administering at least some type of um, first aid and Damon the youngest boy at this point was still clearly alive Devin 
it was fairly obvious according to first of all what Darren was saying. Darren said it's no use. Um, you know, any air I blow into his mouth is coming out of the wounds in his chest. Um, it was clear Devin likely was no longer alive, but Damon was, you know, face down on the floor and his eyes were up and he was looking at the officer and his mom and kind of looking around and Waddell said that he could hear Damon almost as if he was gasping for breath. So that's why he was telling Darley, you know, go and tend to your son. But according to him, Darley never went and did this. Now, there's been a lot of speculation around the 911 call, and if you did sit through it, um, I will have at least played it past that point, where it's claimed that you hear Waddell say, you know, she needs to sit down, or you need to sit down, you need to go sit on the couch, you need to sit on the floor. Um, I personally was not able to hear that in that. Again, I'm not an expert. I haven't dissected all of the audio. Darley began to tell Waddell that she woke up to an attacker in the home and that she struggled with him for a bit right there near the bar where she was standing. And he ran through the kitchen after that and towards the garage. And she said that he dropped the knife on his way out. This is pretty much the same thing she told the 911 dispatcher that this attacker woke her up and you know he ran out, dropped the knife and was so went somewhere in the garage. Darley kept telling the officer that she had picked up the knife and probably ruined the fingerprints. And this is another thing that was said in the 911 phone call. The second time she mentioned the knife in the phone call, the dispatcher told her to not touch anything. And Darley said, I've already touched it. I probably messed up the fingerprints. Um, and Waddell thought that this was a little bit odd that she brought up this information. Um, obviously, it's kind of important to be like, I've already touched things in the crime scene. However, she seemed very, very focused on the fact that she had touched the knife and telling him repeatedly um, that she touched the knife instead of taking care of her son. She was very, uh, she just was kind of standing still and he said he, he didn't understand why she wouldn't go help her son because her son was staring at her. Um, like basically asking for help the best way that he could given the fact that he had been stabbed multiple times. When backup arrived, Sergeant Wallen, he arrived at 2.37 a.m. So Waddell was only there for a couple of minutes by himself. And they did a sweep of the house the second that he got there. They checked the garage. Um, they checked upstairs and they were not able to find this intruder anywhere. So once the scene had totally been cleared, they finally allowed the emergency responders, the um, EMS, I think it was actually fire personnel that showed up. Um, they went ahead and allowed them in the home to start treating the kids and Darley. Damon at this point was immediately picked up and taken to an ambulance and because Darley was hysterical and Darren seemed very upset as well, Waddell had told them to go and sit by the back sliding glass door so that they didn't get in the way of the people trying to help their children. Um, but either way, Damon was taken outside to the ambulance and treated and he ended up passing away in the ambulance and Devin was left in the living room because he was clearly no longer alive and uh, obviously at that point they just wanted to leave him there for the purposes of understanding the crime scene. At this point, Darley was then taken to the hospital. I do believe somewhere in this timeline, she was taken out front and the officers started to tend to her as well as Darren while the children were being taken care of. Um, but she ended up arriving to the hospital at about 3.25 a.m. and by 3.40, she was in the operating room undergoing surgery. Darley had an incised wound on her right forearm and what incised basically means, it's different than a stab. Incised means that the um, like surface, the length of the cut is wider and longer than the depth of the cut. So it's again, more of a cut than it is a direct stab. But she had an incised wound on her right forearm. I will have pictures up of this. And then there was, I think also another small incised wound near the large one. She also had an injury to her neck. Um, and as you can see, it looks pretty severe, but apparently according to the surgeons and the different doctors that looked at it, all the medical personnel, um, they were considered to be superficial wounds. I think that the injury to her neck um, was not very deep. However, all the areas where she seemed to be hurt, there wouldn't be much distance to go anyways. I do know that the cut in her throat did reach the carotid artery sheath. Um, and then I think the carotid artery itself, according to one of the medical experts, is about a quarter of an inch away from the sheath. So basically she was very, very close to 
being dead. While Darlie was in surgery, Damon and Devin were officially pronounced dead and I believe Damon was at the hospital at this point and the investigators got to look at him, different medical experts. Um, I even believe some of the family was able to come and look at him as well. Um, and Darren was at the hospital waiting on information from Darlie. He had originally tried to get into the ambulance with Darlie when they left, but they did not want him in there. They wanted to be able to treat her as best as they could, so they kicked him out and I think he got a ride from a friend or a neighbor to the hospital. Meanwhile, while all of this chaos is happening there, officers are at the home trying to figure out what on earth happened and who on earth would do this. You guys, this crime scene was horrific. There was blood absolutely everywhere. There was a lot going on and officers were trying really hard to process the scene. Now, for the most part, the home was guarded so that nobody could just walk in and walk through. Um, I think three different officers took turns standing guard at the home during this time. Officer Waddell obviously was one of the first ones who was standing guard at the home. Um, Officer Wade and then Officer Ferry. And I believe Officer Wade and Officer Ferry, I don't think they ever went to the crime scene. I'm pretty sure they just stood outside and guarded so no one could just come in and out. The only people that were allowed in the home at that time obviously were, were Waddell, um, the other first responder, and then paramedics that came and helped the boys. I think there were maybe five of them. I can't remember exactly how many there were. And then Karen, the neighbor that was the nurse, also came to take Drake. And I believe she took Drake outside of the home, but she later came back in the home before the walkthrough was done to grab the family dog at 6.09. And she was escorted in by Officer Maine and she just went straight upstairs and came back down. Now, Lee Detective Patterson was assigned this case and he arrived on the scene between 3 to 3.30, so probably right after Darlie and Damon had been taken away by an ambulance. And he just briefly, I don't even think he went inside the home, I think he just like peeked inside and then he looked around the backyard before getting ready to go ahead and head off to the hospital to speak to Darlie and hopefully Darren. But before he was able to do that, a neighbor started, you know, waving her arms, trying to get the attention of someone. And she kept saying, I need to speak to a police officer. Now, Patterson went over to speak to this woman and she said that she saw something right before all of the authorities arrived or like right as they were leaving. She claimed that a dark car was parked. I can't, I don't remember, they don't like state it very clearly in the transcripts if the car was... Um, in front of like her house or if the car was in front of the Routier home. Um, but she said that a dark car had been sitting there and it left almost as soon as um, authorities arrived on the scene. And she thought this was odd because you don't normally see people going in out of the neighborhood at that time. And she didn't recognize this car as being someone who lived in the neighborhood either. Another woman approached saying that her mother who did some cleaning for the Routiers, um, she was with her mother I think the day before, and keep in mind this is at like three in the morning, so it could have been just like hours before, like the night before, but she said they were there and they noticed, or her mom noticed a dark car in the alleyway behind the Routier home. So the way that it's set up um, is the home's kind of on a curve, I guess, or a corner technically, and the front side of the home is accessible, the side of the home is accessible, and then there is even an alley that runs behind the home, behind all the homes um, along that street. And apparently this woman saw a dark vehicle behind the Routier home just kind of sitting there. And she thought it was odd because again, not many people drove through that. Oh, usually it would only be people who lived at one of those houses. She did not recognize this car and she would come and clean quite frequently. I'm pretty sure her daughter was even one of the neighbors. Um, so she noticed it as being very strange, but I don't think she spoke any English. And when Patterson did try to speak to her, he didn't understand what she was saying. After getting this information, it kind of matched up with the idea that an intruder had been in the home. Maybe someone had been watching the home for a couple of days. I believe the first woman that claimed to see the home um, had seen the car a few times. I think she saw it the first time about a month prior to all of this happening. And when she approached the car, they sped off and then she saw it again, um, you know, prior to the murders. 
Um, but things were starting to kind of lean towards the fact that yes, an intruder was here and they possibly were in a dark vehicle. So he had this information and he left for the hospital. Well, he was en route to the hospital to start interviews and figuring out how Darren and Darley were. Around 4.30 a.m., dogs were brought to the home to try to track the scent of this intruder. Um, they ended up not finding any evidence at all, suggesting that an intruder had been in the home, but I believe they did lead authorities, specifically Sergeant Tom Ward, to a bloody sock. And it was like a tall white athletic sock, and it was found about 75 yards away from the home, and it was kind of near a drain, like a drain ditch, and then a couple of trash cans. So this ended up being pretty much the only evidence that they found outside of the home, suggesting that anyone had fled the scene. There were two knives found in the backyard of one of the homes along the alley, but they ended up finding out that these knives were just used for gardening. Um, I believe that they didn't think they were involved to begin with anyways, because they were clearly caked in dirt and they were sitting by a bunch of newly planted flowers and things like that. So they didn't think it was involved, but when they did check, it was just more proof that those knives had just been there and used for gardening purposes. Shortly after this, the walkthrough was conducted by a man named James Cron. Now, James Cron has since passed away, but at this time he was a retired police investigator, but he had a ton of experience. I think it was like 20,000 case like crime scene cases he had worked on um, and they brought him in specifically to help because this town did not typically experience things like this. Um, I think there were only like a small handful of murders a year, if even that. So they wanted to bring someone in with a little bit more experience. Uh, he was accompanied by Sergeant David Neighbors, who was the supervisor of physical evidence along with officers Maine and Walling. And I think I believe at this point, the original officer on the scene, Waddell, had left to go back to the police station to start working on a report. It took until about 6.37 to complete the walkthrough, and Maine, after this, stayed inside to start photographing the scene. All of this was happening at around 6.11, so kind of in the middle of this walkthrough. Patterson, the lead detective, along with his assistant, Chris Frosch, arrived to the hospital to interview Darley. Now, they had sat in the waiting room with Darren for a little bit, and apparently he was questioned. Um, I know Frosch took notes, but Patterson did not. I don't think they even like formally questioned him. I think they just spoke to him for about 15 to 20 minutes. Patterson also went in and was able to visually kind of examine for himself Damon. Um, and then finally he went in and spoke to Darley. When he went in to speak with Darley, she'd only been out of anesthesia for maybe an hour. And I think just minutes before he came in, 10 to 15 minutes, she had been given 25 milligrams of Demerol for her pain. Now he did ask her if she felt okay enough to speak with him and she said that she did, but this has kind of been one of the big controversies around um, some of the evidence in the case. So Darley told him that that morning, she woke up to see an attacker over her and she said that she struggled with this attacker um, and that he was wearing a black shirt. He had on a baseball cap, a dark baseball cap. He had hair that was maybe like shoulder or maybe collar length, but that's pretty much all she could say. I think she said at least his shirt like wasn't a button shirt. It was kind of just like a t-shirt, like a pulled over shirt, um, but she didn't notice anything else about this man. They were able to photograph her injuries. I do want to mention real quick that in this case, it seems that she changed the location where she struggled with this attacker. Um, I have not seen the notes again because Patterson did not take notes. Um, Frosch apparently took notes, um, but it seems from the way she stated it and the way that it's worded online that she attacked or struggled with this attacker while she was on the couch. Like she woke up and struggled with him. Whereas she told Waddell that she struggled with the attacker by the bar. Now, again, do not take that as 100% fact because the information is all across the board, all over the place online. So definitely do your own research. Darley spent the next few days in the hospital. They kept the crime scene closed off as a crime scene to investigate as much as they possibly could. I think this 
crime scene was the most thoroughly processed crime scene that they had ever had before in Rowlett, Texas. I think that they took over 100 DNA samples, which was something that was not very common. Um, and by the 8th, Darley was released from the hospital and she immediately was picked up by officers uh, to go be taken to Rowlett Police Department to be interviewed by Patterson for a second time now that she was not, you know, freshly out of surgery on medication and had a few days. This time, she was just writing a written statement. She apparently did briefly speak to Patterson beforehand um, and it was not recorded. Um, and then she sat down to write her statement and this time a little bit more detail of her story came out and things again seemed to change a little bit. Darley said on the 5th, they had an average day. Darren came home and I believe Darley's sister was with him. They both worked for the same, obviously his electronic company and they decided to eat dinner together. I think when they came home, the boys were playing with a neighbor and then they were called in, they had dinner. And then I believe after dinner, Darley started to say that she wasn't feeling very well. So she asked Darren to drive her sister home. When Darren got back, Darley said that the boys had decided they wanted to have a little sleepover in the living room downstairs. So they could, you know, lay on the floor, set up like their little cot areas, watch a movie and or TV and go to sleep. And Darley said that she was going to sleep on the couch downstairs with them. Their youngest son, Drake, had been waking her up frequently throughout the night and she had not been getting any good sleep and was feeling a little bit frazzled. So she figured maybe sleeping downstairs away from the baby for a night would be beneficial to her. Darley said that she spoke to Darren for a bit after the boys were finally asleep and spoke to him about the fact that she'd been struggling with depression, postpartum depression more than likely. And she said that she was very upset because Darren's car had broken down. So he was using her car during the day and she wasn't able to go anywhere with the boys. She was cooped up in the house with three kids all day long while he was at work. And uh, she was struggling a little bit to take care of them and find things for them to do. And it was very overwhelming. And as soon as she would clean up one of their messes, they would make another one. If you're a mom, you completely understand what I'm saying. Um, and so she was just telling him she was upset about this and, you know, wanted him to get his car fixed so that she could use her car. They also apparently spoke about different bills and business things. Um, and then Darren ended up offering to sleep downstairs with her and the two boys, but Darley told him, no, don't worry about it. So he ended up going and grabbing her a blanket and a pillow. And then he went up to bed around 12.30 to one in the morning on the 6th. This, however, is where the story seems to change a little bit again. And, and it's not actually a little bit, it's kind of a lot how it changed. Um, instead of being woken up, as she had stated to the 911 dispatcher, to Waddell, to Patterson, the first time she spoke to him, this time she said that she actually woke up to Damon. Damon had been pushing on her shoulder uh, and was calling to her saying like mommy and pushing on her shoulder and she remembered like jolting up awake and as soon as she opened her eyes she knew Damon was standing beside her and she saw this attacker at the end of her feet. Now she said that once she noticed this man she sat up and he took off running through the kitchen. She said she remembered hearing a glass break and she took off running after him. Now the lights were all off at this point and so she said she, I guess at this point, didn't know that she was bleeding, didn't know that she was wounded in any way, didn't know the boys were wounded. She said that she saw the attacker drop the knife in the utility room, so she went over and picked it up and then turned around and went to turn the lights on and set the knife down on the bar and that's when she kind of noticed that she was covered in blood and the entire house was covered in blood and she saw Devin face up on the floor and his chest was just profusely bleeding. Um, she said at this point she called out for Darren. She just screamed Devin's name over and over and over again. Darley said that Darren came downstairs in just a pair of jeans and without his glasses on and that he immediately went over to start performing CPR on Devin. She said while this is happening, she called 911 and put a towel on Damon's back to stop his bleeding. Um, he was face down and his back seemed to be, you know, wounded. Um, and the rest of the details in her story appear about the same. 
Darren also made a written statement. He said the same things Darley did for the most part, that they had a conversation that night about money and about his business and about bills and how Darley was struggling with taking care of the kids. Um, and then he said that he went to bed at around 1 a.m. with Drake upstairs alone in their bedroom and uh, that he woke up to Darley screaming Devin's name over and over again. The only difference which could be absolutely nothing or it could be something. I don't know, but I wanted to state it because I saw it as a discrepancy and I thought it was kind of odd that they both like were very specific about these two bits of information um, was that Darren said that he did not have his jeans on, but he did have his glasses. So she said he came down with jeans on and no glasses. He said that he didn't put his jeans on. He was just an underwear and he did grab his glasses before running downstairs. He said that he performed CPR on Devin before running upstairs to put jeans on before running out of the house where he met Officer Waddell and asked for Karen, the nurse, to come and help and then grab Drake. The boys were examined when autopsies were done. It was found that Devin had two stab wounds, very deep stab wounds to his chest. Um, I think one of them, if not both of them, punctured his heart. He died pretty much instantly, and I do not think that he, there's any evidence that he ever woke up from his sleep. Um, and the force in which he was stabbed was enough to nick the concrete underneath of him, like the foundation, which is very upsetting. Um, both of his wounds were very deep. I think between two inches and I think one of them was two inches and one of them was five. I do believe he had a few incised wounds. Damon had been stabbed six times in the back, puncturing his lung and his liver. And medical examiners said that he probably would have been alive for um, a few minutes. I think like tops 10 minutes. I think they said around eight to nine minutes is what it would have taken but his injuries were also very deep, just like Devin's. Um, again, going anywhere between like two inches deep to five inches deep. Um, it was brutal and it was horrific. And um, Damon was alive to experience the pain and what had happened to him and the chaos going on around him for at least around eight to nine minutes after being attacked. I've tried to get through this next part. If you can't tell, recording it a couple of times, but this is like one of the first things that I read about this case that just absolutely destroyed me. Um, and I'm a mom, so I feel like it hits a little bit different, um, but oh my goodness, I can't. My kids are literally the same age and this makes me like want to throw up. Um, they were buried together in the same casket holding hands. It's heartbreaking. It is so sad. And the whole community was just devastated and they were scared because who on earth could do this sort of thing to two children just like in, to people in general but to two sleeping children who could do something like that and to top it off you know these people that lived in this neighborhood they thought that they were safe their neighborhood was not known for things like this their entire town was not known for things like this. And there was a mom who said that her son had spent the night just the night before. And what if he had been there? I can't imagine what any of these people were thinking. I don't know how any of them slept at night after this. Um, the whole community and especially this neighborhood was just filled with young families with children. And this was just so scary. And this was such an extreme, extreme crime. And authorities were still trying to piece this together and figure out what happened. And the idea that this person was still out there somewhere and may be someone living daily in that community was horrifying. The following day after the burial, on June the 10th, Darley was asked to come in for a third interview with Patterson where he took more pictures of her wounds. And I will put those pictures up here. Um, the first ones were done on the 6th and then uh, these were done on the 10th. And I believe he again asked her to lay out the events of the night to him. I can't find any information on what exactly was said in this particular circumstance, um, but he, I think, asked her again what happened. Then a few days later, it would have been Devin's seventh birthday. 
and the family decided to gather together that morning and throughout the day um, they had a prayer service in the morning and kind of like a little memorial and then later on they ended up having a birthday party at the grave as well with his friends his invitations had already been sent out. His birthday party was supposed to be just days after he was brutally murdered. And I mean, presents were bought, balloons were ready, like everything was ready. So they decided, you know, Devin would probably want us to celebrate still. He would still want us to have a good time. Charlie's sister ended up bringing cans of Silly String because Devin and Damon both absolutely loved Silly String. Devin in particular, it was like his absolute favorite thing. And Darlie's sister thought, you know, what better way to celebrate than to grab the Silly String. So there's a video of all of this happening and everyone's there, Drake is there, and they're, you know, smiling and laughing and balloons are up and Silly String is, you know, going all over the grave and the balloons. And this video went wild. The community was disgusted and I don't even think disgusted is a, is the word that they would choose to use. I've heard how a few people have described it and they are words that I'm, you know, not even willing say, to say on here, um, but everyone thought this was the most shameful thing that Darlie and her family ever could have done, more specifically Darlie. People were saying that her demeanor in this video was way off base for what a mother who had just lost two of her children right in front of her should be doing and how she should be acting and appearing outwardly. Um, they were saying that she appeared to be uncaring and it almost seemed like a mockery. She's just smacking her gum and spraying silly string while she's grinning. And this ended up really putting her in the spotlight. People were really starting to question Darlie. And there was something that happened less than a year prior that really pushed people to look at her in this way. There was a woman, I think only 11 months prior to this, and her name was Susan Smith. And a lot of you guys might be familiar with this case. Um, it was huge. She had killed two of her sons. Well, she killed her two sons. Um, she was from South Carolina and it was all over the news. She, I think, said that her car had been taken and drove off with her children in it. And she, I mean, came on to plead to the public, just crying and hysterical, saying, bring my boys back, bring my boys back. But then I think it was nine days later, she ended up cracking to authorities and saying, you know what? I've been lying this whole time. I actually drove my car with my boys in it into a river and killed them. And this was kind of something people obviously were not very used to. Stuff like this didn't happen a lot. At least it didn't get media like it does now. Unfortunately, I feel like this happens all the time. Um, but she just cried and cried and cried and was so upset and had tricked everybody. Everyone was so heartbroken for this mother when it, the reality was that this mother had killed her children and lied to everyone about it. And this was fresh on everyone's mind. So a lot of people believe that because of that, people were very quick to think that Darlie, especially because of this video, was potentially responsible for her children's death. And the public weren't the only ones that felt like this. Just days after this birthday celebration, Darlie went in for a fourth interview. And this time she was interviewed by a man named Bill Parker. And Bill Parker was a retired police officer. I have seen that he was known for being uh, ridiculous at questioning people and getting confessions out of people. And so they brought him in because they wanted to speak with Darlie. And I think essentially wanted her to confess to the crime. She was in this interview for three hours and halfway through, Bill Parker told her that they already had a warrant for her arrest in the murders of her children. She ended up speaking with Bill Parker for I believe another hour, hour and a half after this was told to her without asking for an attorney. And once she finally realized they're not joking, they really do have an arrest warrant for me, she asked for an attorney at which point they immediately arrested her. Now, I have seen that this whole entire interview was apparently not recorded. 
I've seen in different statements that Patterson made during the trial, not about this very particular occurrence, but just in general, that it wasn't their typical practice to record interviews. They kind of like took notes and things like that, and that was pretty much it. They didn't use tape recorders or anything, um, which a lot of people found very confusing and strange. Uh, but this apparently was not recorded. And according to Bill Parker, he asked multiple times during this interview, did you kill your children? And Darley's response was, if I did, I don't remember it. So this, I guess, was enough to go ahead and arrest her on top of whatever else they had. Um, and everyone felt the same thing they felt when Susan Smith was arrested. They felt like they had been tricked by this woman. Now, I want to read the reasonings on the arrest warrant for why they decided to arrest her, why they felt like she was involved and fully responsible for the deaths of her children. Now, one of the very first reasons was something we've already spoken about. Darley was instructed by Officer Waddell to tend to her children when he arrived three separate times. And she, he said that she did not, that she instead would deflect and be talking about how she left her fingerprints on the knife and probably destroyed any other fingerprints. Um, she was very, very worried about her own wounds and was not tending to her child. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this in particular because in Waddell's first report that he made, he does not mention this at all. I don't even think that he mentions asking her a single time to go and help her children. Um, and then he went back the following day to make a supplemental report. And I think this is when he added in that he asked her multiple times to go tend to her children and she refused to do it. Officer Waddell and others also found it very, very odd because the entire time after authorities arrived, Darley didn't ask about her kids. Like he, Waddell was stating that he was like bracing himself for when they took Damon out of the home because typically when a child that's in that state is taken away from the mother or the parents, all hell breaks loose. They try to get to their child. They're like, where are you taking them? I want to go with them. I don't want them to leave me. And um, as a parent, I completely understand that. And so he was bracing himself expecting that when Damon was taken out of the home and Darley apparently didn't react at all. And he just thought that was a little bit odd. Also apparently didn't ask at all how Drake was upstairs. Um, and also during the 911 call, they thought it was strange because she first stated that her boy was dying. And then later on, she stated, my babies are dying. Um, and they thought that this was a questionable thing to say because Damon was still breathing at the time. And um, I don't know, I'm not quite really sure why that's that odd to them, but I guess they had their reasons. Um, I think she was just kind of frantically saying stuff, but I'm not an expert. Charlie also apparently told officers at the scene, and I haven't been able to find out who, but I have not been able to finish all the transcripts yet. But she apparently told an officer on the scene that she realized she was stabbed when she was still laying on the couch. But then in later interviews, she said that she didn't notice that she was bleeding or stabbed until after she picked up the knife in the utility room. So complete change in story again. This also led to authorities finding it very strange that she originally said that she just kind of woke up and her attacker was standing by her feet to she woke up to Damon pressing on her shoulder and calling out for her. Um, you know, I, I have seen that there was a bloody handprint as if Damon tried to push himself up. So I think maybe it's possible and I'll kind of get into that a little bit later on and other reasons. Um, but it was just kind of strange because she left that out of a handful of her stories before adding it in. Um, she also had a few different versions of how she found the knife. One, one time she said that she saw the attacker actually drop it. Like she personally saw that attacker drop the knife in the utility room. And then a couple other versions were that she walked in and saw the knife down on the ground. Um, it just kind of switched up over and over again. There was one point where she said that she didn't even notice that the knife was down on the ground until she turned the lights on in the living room in the um, kitchen. And where she said she was standing when she saw it and where she claimed the knife was, you couldn't even see that area from where she claimed to have been standing. They then brought up and the warrant, the evidence that they found or evidence that they expected to find and they never found. 
There was apparently no blood at all in the garage where Darlie claimed the attacker ran through after brutally killing both of her children and attempting to kill her. It totally stopped after the utility room. There's tons of blood in the living room, some in the entryway of the home from the door. There's lots and lots of blood in the kitchen, especially around the sink. And then there's a few drops leading to the utility room. There was a lot of blood on the utility room door and I think the washing machine, but and a few drops on the utility room floor, but it totally stops after that, completely stops. There was also no blood at all on the window that the attacker would have had to climb through in order to get out of the home. There was no blood on the window screen. There was no blood at all in the backyard. When officers arrived, the back door to the yard was closed, indicating that if this person had come out of that back window area and into the backyard, he would have had to open the gate and then close it. And first of all, the gate was kind of rigged. It was not, the door was not working properly. I think it was held together by wire. So you had to struggle with it to begin with. So this attacker would have had to have been touching this door, left no blood whatsoever, um, and then decided it would be great to take the time to also close it back when you would expect an attacker at that point to just try to be getting out of there as fast as possible. There was also no disturbance at all in the mulch or the flowers. Now, it was not directly underneath the window. I've seen a lot of reports state that authority said the mulch under the window was not disturbed. It was far away from the window. Um, so the, the attacker would not have had to have run through the mulch, but the fastest way to get to the back door would have been coming out of the window, staying along the house so you would not be seen instead of running through the middle of the yard and running through the mulch and the flowers to the gate, but none of the mulch had been disturbed. None of the flowers were disturbed. They also found bloody footprints inside of the home on the kitchen floor, and these bloody footprints matched Darlie's footprints. These footprints appear to just be going to and from the sink, like from the sink to the living room and back. And apparently Darlie never stated that she ever went to the sink at all in any of her statements. And the fact that there was a ton of blood over by the sink, they figured that probably would have been a place she would have remembered being. There also was absolutely no evidence that a bloody knife had been dropped in the utility room. When you drop a bloody knife, um, or pretty much any object onto a linoleum floor like that, it's going to, no matter what way it falls, kind of bounce. And the impact is going to have a lot of blood splatter. There's, if the knife falls on its side, usually will be like an imprint of the knife, um, or you can tell if the tip has hit, you can tell, you know, blood splatter analysis is insane how much they can learn from what happened looking at the direction and the velocity and all the information when it comes to the different droplets. And there was just no evidence at all that any knife had dropped in the utility room like Darlie had said. And while she claimed there were all these different ways that she found the knife, the story always remained the same that the attacker had dropped it in the utility room. There was also broken glass from a wine glass. And in one of her stories, I think the written one, she did state that she heard glass breaking as she was getting up to chase this attacker. Um, and this glass had fallen off of the wine rack and it was kind of all over the floor where you would enter into the kitchen. So it's almost like no matter what way you would have tried to go in the kitchen, either toward the sink or straight, um, you probably would have been walking through glass. But first of all, there was a safety mechanism in this wine rack. So I'm again gonna have a picture up of it, but it's really blurry. You hang the glasses upside down by their base. They're hanging and there's a lip that goes up at the very edge. So in order to get these glasses off, you have to pull them forward and then like push them up and maneuver them over this lip. And it's there so that if you hit this wine rack or bump into it, they can't just fall off. There's this stopper that's preventing them from doing that. So authorities, when they saw that, we're expecting to see more things on this wine rack out of place, um, but that's not at all what they found. There was a pair of tongs resting on something on the wine rack, I think maybe an ice bucket. There were a handful of small objects that were just very carefully resting on other objects that had not moved at all, which indicated that this wine rack was not hit or budged or anything like that. Um, or those items would have fallen. So it didn't make sense how that one wine glass had lifted itself up and over and shattered on the floor. Plus all of that broken glass was sitting on top 
of blood. Now, keep in mind Darley's version of the events. This attacker ran through, knocked a glass off, it shattered, she ran afterwards. This meant that at this point, there would be no blood in the kitchen, especially not Darley's. And she ran through after the glass. Common sense would tell you that the blood would end up on top of the glass, but it was not, it was under which doesn't make any sense. Um, they thought, you know, maybe she kicked the glass around with her feet while she was running through and that put it over the blood. But when they checked Darley's feet, there was no evidence of any sort of injury at all. So she had not run through this glass at all. There was also a vacuum cleaner that was tipped over on the floor in the kitchen. And you would have had to kind of totally maneuver around this vacuum cleaner to get to the sink. And underneath this vacuum was more blood splatter and were blood droplets and also so, um, footprints, bloody footprints. So this vacuum had to have been put there or fallen there after Darley was already running around covered in blood. So it's not like that vacuum cleaner was knocked over by the attacker or anything like that. Also, despite the multiple claims that she stated that she chased this attacker out of the home, the blood droplets on the floor of the kitchen were round. This means there was no high velocity movement. The blood droplets would only be round if someone was standing there or very slowly walking through the kitchen. So this idea that she chased this attacker through the kitchen was just really not matching the evidence that they were seeing. They also did not see any substantial amount of blood on the couch where is, which is one of the places that she did claim that she was stabbed. I have seen some people state that she never actually said where she was attacked. Um, I know that was something very unclear and it's still very unclear to me. I would assume because she woke up to an attacker standing over her and she got up and chased them out, that that means she was stabbed before even waking up, which is questionable kind of in itself. There were no nicks in the couch leather indicating that there was any sort of struggle like she claimed there were a handful of times. There was no splatter to indicate a struggle. Um, it just was not making a lot of sense. Authorities stated that most of Darley's blood after you know testing appeared to be in the sink and around the kitchen sinks. Since Darley had not stated ever going to the sink, they decided to check the area with luminol to see if there was anything else there because it looked by the naked eyes if some cleaning had been done and sure enough when they sprayed luminol everything lit up completely um handles that did not appear to have blood on them they had been wiped off clean there was blood all down the front um cabinets in front of the sink as well i have seen that they opened the cabinets and there was blood on the inside of the cabinet doors and this was really questionable because that's where all the cleaning supplies were kept um, so they really believed someone had cleaned up some of this blood at the sink. Authorities from all this information, and wow, that was a lot of information. I'm just going to go 10 times deeper into it in a little bit. They believe that Darley was responsible for the murder of her two children and the wounds were all self-inflicted. They believed that she stood over the sink and slashed her own throat and cut her own arm. And that's why all of the blood seemed to mainly be there and not on the couch. They had a medical examiner look at her wounds, I believe while she was in the hospital. And this medical examiner did state that it would be possible that they were self-inflicted. He wouldn't say like without a doubt they were self-inflicted, but he said it could be possible. Um, and it was a huge issue as well because the boys were very severely injured. They had deep, deep stab wounds, like actual stab wounds into their chest and back area. But Darley had these very, I hate even using the word superficial because I feel like when you almost have your carotid artery slashed, that's like not superficial, um, but I'm not a medical examiner. These superficial wounds that she had just were not consistent with the same kinds of wounds that her children had. She had this slash in her throat. Um, and even though she had a slash in her arm that appeared deep, if you even feel your own arm, because that the knife apparently did hit bone, it's only about an inch tops till you hit bone right here. Maybe not even. So while it appeared to be a serious wound because it hit bone, it wasn't even that far for the knife to go anyway. So 
And also it was just completely different locations. So it didn't make a lot of sense. The medical examiner also said that Darley appeared to have what are called hesitation wounds. And the way this was described is that hesitation wounds are smaller incised wounds near a larger, more severe wound, whether it be incised or a stabbing. Basically it's when someone goes and is going to self-inflict a wound um, our natural reaction is to stop when we feel pain. And so that's when you get a hesitation wound and it takes a minute for the person to then go and try again. And sometimes they're successful. Sometimes there's a few more hesitation wounds, um, but it appeared as if the small nick by her arm was a hesitation wound or could have been a hesitation wound. Um, and then the one in her chest could have also been a hesitation wound. The authorities believed that Darley killed her children, planted this sock outside to support the idea that an attacker fled the scene. They believed she then came in and inflicted all of her wounds and staged the crime scene. Not in that like particular order, but she did all of that and then called Darren and 911. They decided at this point to go ahead and charge her with capital murder. They charged her for the murder of Damon because Damon was the youngest. He was five years old. And um, if you murder someone six years and younger, you are allowed to be charged with capital punishment. So that's why they decided to go with him. And also because of the capital punishment, she um, they would be trying for the death penalty. Now, because of all the publicity in the case, they decided to try to move the case to a different county. Instead of being in Dallas County, they moved it to Kerr County. And a lot of people question this. A lot of Darley supporters now question this because this county, first of all, was a lot smaller than Dallas County and it was kind of more relaxed and um, you know, the people there probably would have made a lot of quick judgments about Darlie because she liked flashy jewelry. She liked to bleach her hair. She had breast implants. Um, she wore clothing that a lot of them might look down upon. So, um, they believed that she honestly would have immediately been described as a materialistic woman who probably valued those things over her children. Also on top of that, the courthouse, courthouse was apparently under construction at the time. There was no heat at all and the trial was set for the middle of the winter. Um, it was not equipped to hold press. It just was not a large area for the size of case it was. So a lot of people did not agree with moving this case to Kerr County. A judge put a gag order on the case and Darren and Darley's mother ended up going on a radio show and just totally speaking about the case anyways. And they ended up being charged because of this. They both ended up with subpoenas uh, because of the information that they divulged in this radio show. And they decided to hire an attorney named Doug Mulder. And he was very well known in the area. And after they hired him for their own charges, he decided to also take on Darley's case because Darley originally had a man named Doug Parks as her court appointed attorney, but they didn't believe he was going to do a good enough job. However, he'd already done a lot of work on the case. He had already hired all sorts of experts and had them start digging into the um, evidence. Uh, but apparently what I've seen, Doug Parks originally wanted to explore the idea that Darren could potentially be involved, which is something else I will get into towards like the very, very end of the video. And nobody was happy about this. Darley didn't want this. Um, a lot of family members didn't want this. So they wanted him out and brought in Doug Mulder. Now, in my opinion, this was a huge, huge issue because first of all, Doug Mulder was already representing her husband, meaning that he couldn't drag Darren in court. So it created to me a strange conflict of interest, I guess you could say, and a lot of people believe the same. On top of that, they refused to delay the trial because of change of representation. And with a capital punishment and where the death penalty is being sought, typically, first of all, those cases normally don't go to trial for a very, very long time because you're talking about someone's life hanging in the balance. And whether your opinion is that this person is guilty or not, the attorneys need to have enough time and the experts need to have enough time with the information and to gather as much information as possible. So they know that they are 
it's a fair trial because you don't mess around with someone's life. Um, and unfortunately, instead of having the months to sometimes years that attorneys have to gather a case and get it all ready to go before trial, Doug Mulder had weeks. Uh, huge, huge problem. And on top of that, he apparently refused to use any of the experts that the original that the original attorney Doug Parks had hired and had already working on the different pieces of evidence, um, he didn't hire any of them. I don't think he ever hired any from what I have seen. So there was nobody to dispute any of the experts that the prosecutors were going to bring. And given the fact that they did not have like a ton, a ton of serious evidence against Darley, if those people have been brought in, it might have given her a chance. And that's not me saying if she's guilty or not guilty. I just don't think it was fair representation. And a lot of people believed that Mulder was kind of full of himself, that he was overly confident. And that's why he kind of dismissed what the prosecution was saying and was not prepared to go up against it because he kind of created this idea in his mind that he could do whatever and totally get her out of it and he wasn't worried about it um and that kind of took away what should have been done for her um in terms of representation now despite the fact that the conditions of the courthouse were not great uh people flooded in when the trial started in january of 1997 so we're talking just months after the murders um i have not been able to read every bit of transcripts like i have told you guys from the trial because it is just a lot i have read what i can and to top it off there's actually two different versions of the transcripts <laughs> which i will get into later so i definitely couldn't read both of them um but it is it's a wild ride you guys so there was a lot, a lot of character evidence that was brought forward that a lot of people did not agree with. There were people brought on the stand claiming that Darley was very self-centered and very materialistic. Um, they had a lot of strange emphasis on the prosecution side that she had breast implants and like they would bring it up at the weirdest times. Um, they'd be like, oh, she's, a, you know, she's not a good mom or she definitely didn't care for her children because did you know, did you know that she had breast implants? And they kind of used those to say, well, that's why she didn't stab her trunk area when she was self-inflicting these wounds because she didn't want to mess up her breast implants, which totally, maybe, but there was just this very bizarre focus on things like that. It also brought people up to the stand showing that she was not necessarily the doting mother that everyone thought she was. There were a few people that testified saying that they heard her cursing and screaming all the time at her children or about her children. Um, and that basically when she could have them out of the house and leaving her alone, she would have them out of the house and leaving her alone. Nurses from the hospital also came to the stand and testified that um, she did not seem to care much. And the defense really argued against this saying their notes say that she was tearful and that she was hysterical and she was upset. But all the nurses said, no, you don't understand. Like in our notes, we cannot, we cannot put our opinion in there. We have to be, you know, use very bare minimum descriptive, typical phrases. Um, they're like, if we had put, oh, she's being whiny. Um, oh, we think she's fake crying, um, you know, that would be inappropriate. So they, so they said that they felt like they just could not write what they were actually thinking. And I think almost every single one said that they thought she was not reacting the way that a typical mother would after her children have just been killed. They said that she would sometimes get tears in her eyes, but no one really ever actually saw her cry. Um, there was, again, one nurse that stated that she was whining a lot. She was very whiny in the sense of when she would seem to get upset it didn't come off as being genuine it was more of like a whiny complaint I guess you could say um, there were a few times that she was described as having a very flat effect when speaking about the boys and just overall unemotional given the circumstances the prosecution brought forward the silly string video and this was a huge issue because um, the defense did not try to bring in another video. So I've already told you guys about that day. They had a prayer service or a prayer ceremony. And then afterwards they had this silly string birthday party. And, um, the prayer service would have been a great way to kind of show 
A different side that Darlie was showing, she, according to her attorneys and people in her family, was very upset that day, that morning at least, and um, was crying and taking a part and being a part of this prayer ceremony. Um, but the defense, for some reason, did not enter that into the evidence. Um, and the silly string video apparently was a huge thing for the jurors. When they were deliberating after the trial, they apparently asked to watch that, I think, over a dozen times. Um, so it was a crucial part and how the jurors decided if, Day, if Darlie was guilty or not. But apparently this bit of uh, this video, her attorney did bring it up in I think the pre-trial hearings. And he accused the officers of committing a felony. So basically what happened is that Patterson and I think one other officer, a few other officers planted wires and cameras in the graveyard around the kid's grave without getting a court order and nobody knew. So none of these people knew that they were being recorded that morning um, or at all that day. And Mulder basically said, you committed a felony. And because of that, Patterson decided to go ahead and get a lawyer because he was being accused of a crime. And um, they basically could not speak about that video unless the criminal element to it was taken out basically. I hope any of that just made sense. Um, but they could have still brought this video in to show a different side of things, but they did not. And when Patterson and the other officer were questioned about the video, just period, like at all, even not in relation to the criminal activity possibly behind it, they pled the fifth. And that is something that the whole, it shocked the whole entire courtroom. Different journalists that were there said that they had never seen an officer plead the fifth before or invoke their fifth amendment at all during a trial hearing. And um, so basically something that could have been important and useful for Darlie's side was totally trashed. Also during the trial, it was pointed out that Darlie and Darren continue to change their story. I think even through the trial from what I've seen, basically once a new argument was brought forward that pointed towards Darlie's guilt, um, Darlie and Darren seem to then add details to their story or change their story to explain that. Now I will say, sometimes you just forget things. Until someone points something out, sometimes you don't think about mentioning it or something. Um, but these were kind of like, these were kind of bigger bits of information that you probably wouldn't forget. Um, but again, I don't know. So for instance, once it was brought up that Darlie did not tend to her boys, and once it was brought forward that the sink was covered in blood, and so they believed that Darlie had inflicted her own wounds above it, all of a sudden Darlie and Darren claimed that the reason Darlie was going back and forth from the sink and there was so much blood there was because she was wetting towels and bringing them over to tend to both of her boys. So she was running back and forth with wet towels. Now, this was what they suddenly changed their story to. And this was argued because, first of all, there was no diluted blood as if water had been carried in a, you know, soaking wet towel back and forth from the kitchen. No blood on Darlie's shirt was diluted, no blood on the boys was diluted. Um, so this whole wet towel story, it, it didn't happen. Could it have been a dry towel and they just, you know, explained wrong? Yes, however, if it had been a dry towel, that wouldn't explain why Darlie was at the sink. So just throwing that out there. However, the prosecution stated that Waddell did not witness Darlie running back and forth as she claimed putting these wet towels on the boys or even dry towels on the boys. He even stated that when he got there, even though Darlie wrote in her written statement that she laid a towel on Damon's back, that no towel was there. And I believe the other first responders as well stated that they did not see a towel there. Um, I know there were 20 some towels in total taken from the home. I believe only five or six of them had blood on them. Um, and I think majority of the blood was Darlie's indicating that she had used those to press um, a towel onto her wound and her neck. So once this was kind of argued, Darlie and Darren then stated that um, this actually happened while she was on the phone with 911 and that's why Waddell didn't see it. But then the prosecution said, well, wait a minute. 
Um, so you're on the phone with 911 and you're holding a rag to your neck, which is what you've been saying you've done this whole time. So where is your third hand that's then wetting these towels and taking them to your boys? So basically things kept shifting and changing based on the information that was being circulated. They decided to bring in an expert to listen to a nine, the 911 phone call and there also was no running water in the background of this phone call. They were able to hear the dog barking upstairs, um, but if she had been at the sink right there, they would have heard water and they just didn't. So after kind of all of those different stories and you know explanations were exhausted, Aaron said that um, Waddell had never actually asked Darley to take care of the boys. He hadn't actually done anything. He said that when Waddell came onto the scene, he was like an immediate deer in headlights, did not move, did not help. He said that he had to scream at Waddell multiple times asking for help and Darley was screaming for help too and he wasn't giving it. So now they're saying the officer has been lying this entire time and he wasn't actually helpful and it was, guys, it was just all over the place and an absolute mess. From what I have seen, Darlie did continue to maintain the version of the story throughout the trial that Damon, and actually until now, that Damon woke her up by pushing on her shoulder and calling to her and then um, the attacker was standing by her feet and she chased him. I've even seen in more recent interviews where she still leaves out the struggle. So I don't know if she just like is dropping random parts to get through the story quicker or what. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea. Um, and from evidence, Damon's blood does appear to be around the couch where Darley was. So I, I think it's very possible. And I actually think he was sleeping on the floor in between the couch and the table right beside his mom. He's a big mama's boy. So I don't know if the blood's just there because Damon was there um, and that's where he was attacked. Um, or if maybe it's there because he was trying to wake up his mom. Again, there was apparently a bloody handprint. Um, that appeared to show he was trying to pick himself up, get up off of a couch um, or off the floor. Um, and then obviously his blood was found again on the other side of the room and his, so was his body. He moved at some point. So I think it's possible he did wake her up, but it's the evidence that kind of, again, makes me question this. Like for instance, when I get into later the blood on her shirt, I would have expected to see more if bleeding Damon was standing there pushing on her shoulder. And if he left a bloody handprint on a surface, why didn't he leave a bloody handprint on her shirt? And again, I'll get deeper into the blood evidence in just a minute. 